and and action. We All can right. see James. Yeah, yeah. He's, J James is dark. Oh, he's still he's, he's a little better. He's a little, he's a little better. It'll get better when we get yeah, to the side. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, all right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the penultimate lecture, a guest lecture by our awesome host, James Percy from Apple on GPU Architecture. Woo! <laughs> so happy. So all right, I'm gonna stop my camera and add make sure to add James's camera here. Uh, add his spotlight. Boom. Now yeah, you're in. I'll take, take, yeah. take mine out. All right, James, you're up. Thank you for that. Thank you for that, Ar Arunan. Uh, comment. James, you're up. Welcome. Thank you so much for coming to share us how GPUs work, what they are, uh, and and actually how to program them. That's the very exciting thing I think students are waiting to see. So good stuff. Let's rock and roll. Great. Thanks for uh, the intro, Dan. Um, so yep, we'll be talking about GPU architecture today. Um, this is a presentation that uh, myself and two of my colleagues at Apple, John Kors and Harold Obermeyer uh, have put together. And um, before we get started, I do, do have one uh, background thing to cover. Um, so, and I know we are recording this for the person of Berkeley, but uh, uh, for the class, I just want to remind everybody else, uh, please refrain from recording or posting or streaming any, any slides or taking pictures uh, due to, to confidentiality purposes. Um, so now we've got that out of the way and I should be better lighting now. Um, so what are we going to talk about today? So I wanted to give a little bit of an overview of, of what is a GPU, um, what do they do for us? Um, we'll get into a little bit of details about the graphics pipeline um, at a high level, and we'll cover some of the major, major stages and talk a little bit about the programmability inside a GPU and why that programmability is powerful. And then we'll walk through a, uh, a programming example, and then uh, hopefully we'll try to I'll try to run a live demo on my on my Mac um, and show you guys um, the power of, of a GPU um, when it comes to parallel programming and, and what we can do. So uh, ask questions along the way right into the chat box. Dan's going to help uh, monitor that for me, and, um, and we'll also try to leave some time at the end to answer questions. So first, what is a GPU? Um, well, a good way to answer that question is actually to compare it to a CPU. Um, many of you, I believe, are, are familiar with what CPU architectures look like. Um, and frankly, CPU architectures are, are a little bit easier to think about. I mean, they are very complicated in their own right for very good reasons. Um, uh, and GPUs are complicated as well, but for, for somewhat different reasons. Um, and, and so what I have here is obviously a very stylized version of a CPU on the left and a, and a GPU on the right um, with, with very similar components that are color coded. And um, at, a, at a really high level, you can think about, um, and hopefully you can see my cursor here, uh, uh, the way a CPU works is there's, there's a whole bunch of uh, control logic to decode and execute uh, uh, instructions. There's execution units that actually do the math and, and run those instructions, and it's backed by memory. Um, usually, a, a hierarchical, hierarchical level of caches, um, and then a memory system. Um, and, the, and the general idea is to get better performance out of a CPU, you want to minimize your latency through all of these different steps. Um, and, and in fact, modern CPUs, the, the number of cycles of latency that you measure from these execution units out to your memory is a critical piece of, of your performance. It's not the only thing that determines your performance, but it, but it is a very important piece. Um, GPUs have similar concerns, and you can kind of see the way that these boxes are stylized is you have many, many execution units. You have smaller uh, control units that are perhaps simpler, but you have more of them controlling all of these execution units. And then you also have these little caches. That's what these kind of yellowish things are associated with each uh, control unit. And they're all backed by the same, the same DRAM. The key point here, and we'll get into some of the, the details of what this actually means, but the key point here is that these blue squares are, are multiplied many, many times. So when you look at a CPU complex, you might have two or three or four, maybe even up to eight CPU cores on a given chip or SOC. On, on a modern G, large GPU, you could easily go up to well, well over 100. And, and that's the key difference. And that's what gives us the big parallel, uh, parallel programming boost that we get, outside, we get from a GPU. And so in order to get the maximum performance from a GPU, 
what you really, your goal really is, is to maximize your throughput through all of these blue execution units. Or in other words, you've got all this, all these parallel processing units, you want to optimize for using as many of them uh, as, as you can. And what we'll, what we'll talk about as we go through this presentation is that maps very well to moving pixels on the screen. You can kind of imagine if you've got a whole bunch of groups of pixels, you can distribute them across this array of execution units and they can somewhat get executed in parallel. So that, that's kind of what we're gonna talk about today. So this slide is is this kind of a breakdown of, of kind of what I just what I just talked about and some of the, the care abouts um, as as we're trying to optimize for CPU and GPU performance. We, I talked about the the number of cores on a CPU. We typically have more on a GPU. Um, frequency we typically care more about on the CPU. It, not so much these days, but there was the frequency wars back in the late '90s and early 2000s, where where all we cared about for CPU performance was just pushing max frequency. GPUs are much less about pushing maximum frequency and just pushing maximum throughput, which is what we talked about on, on the, the previous slide. Um, I'm, I'm not gonna go through every line on this slide, but to hit on a, a couple of points, um, speculation and execution order are important, particularly if you've covered CPU architecture. Um, the speculation and execution order on the GPU tends to be simpler than on a CPU. On a CPU, there's an awful, uh, awful lot of logic and, and area spent around how do I do? How do I do branch prediction? How do I reorder instructions to maximize performance? GPUs typically don't do that simply because doing those kind of optimizations across the number of execution units that we showed in the previous previous diagram is is very complex um, and doesn't scale very well. And so that's not something that we try to optimize on optimize for on, on GPUs. And what that nets out to is our ex execution control tends to be simpler. Um, and then the last thing I'll mention here is, is coherency. Um, kind of likewise on CPUs, there's a, especially when you have a multi-core CPU complex, um, there's a lot of complexity and effort spent around managing coherency across multiple CPU threads. Um, and, and for good reasons, you, you want to have a relatively simple uh, programming model. For, for the GPU where we have a more complicated software programming model, and I'll show some examples of that in a bit, coherency tends to be software managed, meaning if you have two different threads that need to communicate with each other, it's up to the programmer or the developer to manage that synchronization to ensure data consistency. So James, so James, there's, there's a really yeah, funny, right. a, a really nice analogy that Brian brings up, which is he hears analogy for as a CPU is like a math professor and a GPU is like a classroom of elementary school students. And, <laughs> and, you, and you're giving them both math problems, but you want to give the complex problems to the professor and many easy problems to the students. What do you think about that analogy? I, I like it, Brian. Um, it's an interesting analogy. I think if you're, <laughs> you know, if your goal at the end of the day was to get as many simple uh, math problems complete in a short enough in a, in a shortest time as possible then that's a, that's an excellent analogy because what you what you really want is is a bunch of elementary students that can just crank away in parallel at a bunch of of, of, of simple problems simple problems exactly um, yeah. even, even the smartest math professor is is not going to be able to keep up at with with a hundred smart students um, if you're just cranking through through basic math problems so from that perspective I think that's a that's a good way of thinking about it love it love it great thanks Um, so, uh, so, so maximizing throughput, hiding latency. We've talked about throughput. We want to optimize. We want to use these execution units that we have um, as as much as possible. And so, you'll you, many of you may have heard about something called SIMD. Um, SIMD is a very important concept in parallel programming. It stands for single instruction, multiple destination, or multiple data. Um, and and what that means is that you you have one set of instructions. Um, that you're going to execute across um, a large data set. So every element, for example, just say you had a screen with a bunch of pixels on it, every pixel on your screen is going to execute the same instructions. And, and what that gives, gives you is what we call thread level parallelism. And so typically you'll hear about threads or, or work groups or, or warps or, or things like that. Um, and generally, um, the, the work that you put into a thread is all going to be executing the, the, same, um, the same instruction. And, and the work of the GPU and the complexity in the GPU is, is managing that. So how do, I, how do I schedule work across all these different execution units such that I, I get the maximum throughput across all of, all of the data that I have and all the different sets of instructions that I need to schedule? Um, 
And, and so that, that's really what this, what this is about. And there's a lot of complexity about, um, you know, how do these things act, access memory? Um, how do you, uh, and this kind of goes back to current coherency, how do you schedule them? How do they talk to each other? Um, and, and some of that complexity falls on the programmer and the, and the driver, and some of it falls on, on, the, hard, on the hardware. Um, one other thing to, to mention here that's important is, is this memory bandwidth aspect of it. Um, and, and memory bandwidth we'll talk about in the concept in the context of, of pixels and games and images. Um, but typically GPUs have access to very high memory bandwidth, higher, more memory bandwidth that you would have on the, on the GPU, uh, sorry, on the CPU. And the reason for that is if you just imagine um, a game, if you're playing a game and you need to refresh your screen um, uh, 30 times a second for your game to look good, just right there, you need to refresh your screen. You need to touch every, theoretically, every pixel on the screen. But on top of that, you need to render a bunch of stuff behind it. And I'll show you what that rendering looks like. And so you're moving data back and forth um, to generate these, these uh, images multiple times a second. And so you need to have high memory bandwidth to do that, to do that efficiently. Um, and, and so a lot of the GPU challenges and, and optimizations are around um, reducing that memory bandwidth. How do we move less data? How do we have cache hierarchies um, to reduce the, uh, the, the memory that's moving from on-chip to, to off-chip? Or the data, I should say, moving from on-chip to off-chip. So, so those are kind of the basic concepts. Let's talk a little bit about um, what the pipeline looks like and how we, how we uh, apply some of these concepts. Um, so at, at a very high level, um, the a GPU consists of, um, of, of really four or five uh, major, major sections. Um, there's the, uh, the vertex processing section where we are, are processing vertices and we're doing some computation on them. And I'll explain each of these in a little bit more detail. Um, there's, there's rasterization where we're converting triangles into individual pixels that show up on the screen. There's fragment processing where we can actually uh, run programs on individual pixels to develop to um, generate their colors. And then there's the frame buffer section where we actually output the pixels to a buffer in memory so they can be displayed on screen. Um, one detail I glossed over, I mentioned it in the context of fragment processing, but for vertex processing, you can also run individual programs on, on each vertex. And the modern GPUs actually use the same hardware. That's where you see this unified shader core on, on the left here in green to run these programs. Um, and, and that really comes back to the parallel programming model that I talked about in uh, earlier. In order to process millions of, of pixels a second and million, potentially millions of vertices per second, you need to have a large computation energy uh, engine that can, that can run these programs. And so what, you're, what you see kind of in our, our stylized example over here on the right, um, these ind individual pixels, this, these red guys, these blue guys, and these green guys, for example, each of these could be running a program to, uh, to generate these final pixels and, and write them out to memory. So one way to think about that is if you're playing a game and you're seeing pixels on your, on your screen, you may be, um, every, every pixel on your screen is running a program. Now they might be running the same program, the same what's called a pixel shader, um, but they're all running a program. And, and so that's kind of the, the beauty of, of GPU parallel processing. And at the end of the day, and we'll go through kind of examples of what builds up, uh, builds up this frame, um, you get an image that looks, looks something like this. Um, you have objects, which is this, uh, this kind of unicorny, shiny unicorn thing in the middle. Um, you have a background um, with the fireworks on it. You have these, these objects in the background with the M's on them, which stands for metal. These are, these are textures. I'll explain what textures are. You've got this surface that's kind of reflecting. Those are, those are based off of, of textures and lighting models. Um, and so we'll talk about some of the, the details of what goes into making a frame, a frame like this. So let's get into the to the pipeline uh, in, a, in a little bit more more depth. So so typically, um, if if you're making a game, you've got a a model of of your world, or or you at least have objects that you have models of that are made up of of triangles. Um, and so somebody is going to program their game um, in in a graphics API such as Metal. That's what we use on um, Apple Apple devices. Um, and they're, they're basically going to input their models or, or where their vertices are in, 
um, into the game and give them some sort of description of how they connect, how they turn into tuners and triangles. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna run our uh, our vertex processing algorithm that we that we talked about to um, to generate turn these individual vertices into um, into triangles. That's called assembly. You'll notice that we have this kind of world uh, cube or, or 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 shape here where we've actually clipped off a piece of this triangle that does not get rendered. So we go through a process of of clipping pieces of the model that we that we don't see. Um, we rasterize or scan convert them, and you can imagine a process where you, if you have a given triangle, you you literally kind of walk uh, left to right on each pixel uh, on the screen and say, "Hey, is this inside my triangle or not?" And if it is, then yes, you render it. If not, you you throw it away. That's not a that's not a great optimized algorithm for for doing it, but it's an algorithm that will work, and you can kind of conceptualize how you might um, how you might turn a a triangle into individual pixels. Um, then we get into the fra fragment processing where we have, uh, we, we do lighting algorithms. We're going to, for every pixel inside a triangle, we're going to compute a lighting equation. We may texture it and I'll explain what that is, meaning pulling uh, textures from memory. You can compute effects. You can do, um, what, basically whatever you want to, to generate the final pixels. Um, and then we, then we send them off to our screen. So let's dive into vertex processing a little bit. Um, so here we have the same scene that we looked at a minute ago, and this has been drawn in something that's called wireframe in the bottom right here. And you can see the, the unicorn, you can see the, the shapes. And if you look closely, you can see that everything is broken into triangles. Even, even these kind of square-like shapes in the background here, if you look closely, you can see, you can see the diagonal. So, and, and it's been broken into a triangle. And the reason for that is triangles are planar. They're a lot easier for the hardware to, uh, to work with rather than a true 3D, 3D shape. Um, and so the first thing we need to do is we need to get our, our unicorn into the, the right space in the world. And so you can do that with the vertex shader by doing a number of transforms on the unicorn. You can rotate it, you can translate it, meaning move it, you can stretch it in the X or the Y or the, the Z dimension. That's basically what the vertex shader is, is going to do. Um, it's also going to place the world, uh, place a camera in the world. So you can imagine if we were drawing, uh, rendering this in a game, this camera might be like moving around relative to where the unicorn is, or the unicorn might be moving around relative to the camera. Um, it doesn't really matter. The vertex shader is going to get all the objects in, in the world by doing these transforms into a, a specific place so that we can go render it from, from the screen. And James, just to connect this with what the students are doing now, they're working on a faster matrix multiply. That's exactly what's happening here. The transformation matrix, matrix is a four by four matrix and the pixel matrix is a X, Y, Z, W by however many vertices you've got. So basically it's that hugely tall matrix times a four by four, that's all this is doing. And it's like, it's exactly what a GPU was meant for. I mean, before we had general purpose GPUs, we had GPUs that just knew how to do this really fast. Exactly. Take those take those points and then transform them into the right space. Really, that's exactly what they were optimized for. Exactly, and all these, and, these transforms that you guys probably know can be represented as a four by four matrix. And you can actually multiply, pre-multiply and sure you know these, these matrices together, which is what, what you would do in a real vertex shader um, to do these computations. Sorry, Bora, I think you had a, a comment. And no problem, uh, our students do not, fortunately or unfortunately, do not get to, to program a GPU this time around. They just got access to Intel AVX extensions. Got it. Back in the in the good old days when I learned this stuff, um, GPUs actually had what we call fixed function hardware to do these transforms. So what what that would mean is you would you would program more or less a matrix. It wasn't quite described that way, but you would basically program, hey, what is my rotation transformation? What is my translation transformation uh, into the GPU? And it would you would send it send it in vertices and it would do the transforms for you and spit out triangles up up the backside. But basically, what would happen? These days, instead of having that fixed function hardware to do that, to do these specific multiplications, these things are expressed in what we call the vertex shader, meaning you can program in whatever transforms that you want um, and whatever, make, more or less, whatever matrices that you want, as long as they're not nonsensical um, to, to do these transforms. All right, so let's talk a little bit about geometry. Um, and I'm, I'm going to try to pick up the pace a little bit here. 
um, geometry processing. So we, we've taken our triangles, we've now assembled them or primitive, we do primitive assembly into, into triangles. So we're not really de dealing with individual vertices anymore. Um, we're, we're dealing with, with triangles. Um, and um, th this is a little bit of a detail. I'm going to kind of go, go over it somewhat quickly. But one thing that many, not all, but many modern GPUs will do is they will actually take the triangles in screen space. That's what's shown on the left here. Um, and then actually bin them. And that's kind of what this is intended to represent on the right. And so what this, what this picture on the right represents is the lighter colors or the whiter colors represent triangle complexity. So what you can see here is, is um, where we map to the unicorn's hair. There's a lot of little triangles in here to do the hair. Same thing with the tail. Um, and so you can get kind of an approximation for how expensive this piece of the scene is to render just based purely on the number of triangles that are there. Whereas if you go into the background, there are zero triangles, so it's just black, or on these, these two surfaces that we show here, um, there aren't very many triangles, so they're, they're gray or, or close to black. Um, that's important for a number of reasons. Um, it, it lets you estimate how expensive it is to render that piece of the scene, and that can help you with your work distribution, going back to the topic we had beforehand, where it's all about optimizing the throughput of the machine, we can use that to estimate, hey, this piece of the scene is going to be expensive. So we want to be able to distribute this piece of the scene to a lot of our execution units. Um, so that's something that not all GPUs operate this way, but um, many modern GPUs do. OK, so rasterization. So we've, we've, we're at the step now where um, we've got our triangles, and we're going to go, we're going to go do a process called scan conversion. Scan conversion is, is kind of, I mentioned this earlier, it's converting the triangles into individual pixels. And so you could imagine an algorithm where perhaps I start at this, this vertex, I walk along an edge, um, and then until I hit an, uh, another edge, and then I, I walk over a little bit and I walk back. That's, that's basically scan conversion where I've taken this triangle and I've turned it into individual pixels. Um, I'm gonna skip over anti-aliasing uh, for the purposes of this presentation, but you could imagine actually along these edges, you could actually create even more samples for to make higher quality images um, if, if you wanted to. Um, so once I've got my pixels figured out, now I need to go figure out, well, how am I going to how am I going to color them? Um, and that's a step called fragment fragment processing. Um, and so um, with with uh, with every we, we've now got these these triangles in the screen space, we also carry depth information along with each pixel. Um, and we can do something called a depth test. Um, and the depth test basically tells you, is my triangle visible or not? So if you've got two triangles like this that's shown on the screen, they, they intersect. Um, this, let's say this one on the left is in the back. You don't need to render the part of, of that triangle, mostly, um, if it doesn't show up on the screen. So we can just throw it away and only render the, the triangle on, on top. Um, so that, that's what the depth test is. And then the other piece of the scene may just be unwritten. So we might just store a bit for each, each tile, or um, really it means each pixel on the screen that says, hey, this is the clear color. We're not going to touch it. We don't have to do anything with that particular pixel. So now comes the really, the really interesting and exciting part, which is, which is the shading. Um, and so we talked about this, this common unified uh, shader core that executes uh, vertex fragment. And we didn't talk about compute, but we will in a little bit, uh, shaders on, on the hardware. And the shader is what lets you specify that per pixel algorithm that you're going to run to do a, shader, a lighting calculation. And so um, just to, to kind of give some insight on what that might look like is there's a teapot example here. On the left, you see it's just very simply, it's black or white. Um, there's no, there's no interesting shading to it. It's basically just, uh, it, it looks pretty simple. On the right hand side is the same teapot, but it's been shaded with a, with some specular lighting. Um, and what that means is you can kind of see the light uh, reflecting off the top surface of, of the teapot, depending on where the angles of light is coming from, that gives it some, some interesting shading effects. And you can kind of see it on the handle, on the top, and then over here on the, on the spout um, a little bit. And so um, this is a, a relatively uh, simple lighting algorithm, but it does require a fair amount of computation. You have to compute some, some angles. Um, you, you, need, uh, you need to do a texture lookup, and I'll explain what a texture lookup is in a second to go, to go compute this. And you need to do this for every pixel or on, on, on the screen. So it's not a cheap calculation. And that comes back to the fact that 
the, the SIMD algorithm we talked about beforehand, for every pixel on, on this teapot, we're gonna go run this program down here. Um, and we can do that in parallel so that it happens very quickly um, as opposed to if you were doing this a pixel at a time on a CPU, it would take, um, it would, it would take much longer. Um, and that's where the beauty of, of, of having dedicated GPU hardware comes in. So this, um, this particular uh, uh, shading program that I've got as an example down here on the right is, is written in Metal, uh, which is, uh, again, a programming language for, for Apple, uh, Apple hardware. And you can see it's, it's computing um, a, a light angle based off, of, based off of a normal. It's doing a dot product. Um, it's doing a, a texture lookup to figure out the diffuse color. Um, and then it's multiplying the, the diffuse color by, um, by the computed angle of the light. And that's what it's outputting, and that's basically how we're gonna we're gonna shade every pixel of of this teapot. Um, there's there's uh, there, modern shading languages are uh, much more complex. Originally, we could just do kind of simple math math operations um, and and texture lookups. Um, they've gotten more complicated over the years to get better compute operations at matrix multiplies, um, at, at neural uh, special instructions for doing neural nets. Um, anything kind of uh, related to, to parallel processing um, is, is kind of now part of modern GPU shading languages. And I, and I mentioned kind of coherency earlier. There's also instructions for doing synchronization. So you can kind of, you can wait to, for other threads to finish so you can synchronize data. Um, there's, there's some limited amount of, of predication. Um, you don't want to be putting a ton of if then else statements inside your, your shader program. That's not going to be good for performance, but there is uh, there is some support for, for predicated instructions. So this is um, what we're going to come back to uh, at, at the end. And I'll sh hopefully show you a live demo of, of a program running both on the CPU and on, on the GPU. Um, so to talk a little bit more about the execution model. Um, so I talked about how we're going we're gonna to execute this fragment shader on every touched pixel. So every pixel on this, this teapot. Um, and we're going to do that in a way that takes advantage of thread level parallelism, meaning for every pixel, we're going to run the same instruction on multiple data. So we come back to our concept of, of SIMD. So if we're going to do this, imagine um, that this, this kind of square that we have uh, is a zoomed in piece of, of this teapot. Um, you could imagine an algorithm where we just walk one at a time, left to right, um, for each pixel inside this, this square, we run the program. Um, and that would, that would work. But it's obviously very slow because it does everything one at a time. And so the idea of, of a SIMD, uh, SIMD machine is that you have groups that work in, in lock, lock, lock step, excuse me. So you might, just as a simple example, take groups of four, a two by two subsquare inside this big square, and you're going to execute the same instruction on all four of those pixels um, at the same time. And in a simple case where you're just um, executing simple instructions, they're just going to all execute one, two, three, four in, in lock, step, lock step and finish at the same time. Now, you can get into more complicated examples, and I'm, I'm going to gloss over this uh, a, a little bit, where you might have one of those pixels has to run a high latency texture fetch or, or latency operation. And what that means is you have to stall all four of those pixels. So you kind of take them off, um, you stall them. That's what's intended to show in this diagram. And you go find a different set of, of work to go to go run. And so you might find a different um, thread group that you can go execute and can make progress while this high latency operation is, is running. Um, and that's where a lot of the complexity and frankly, the interesting parts of the GPU uh, comes in because you're managing these thousands of threads that are running within the machine and trying to optimally execute them in a, in a way that fills the machine um, in, in the best manner. And that's, that's a really hard, pro really hard problem. I'm going to talk about um, texture mapping briefly. So I have time for, uh, to, to get to the demo. So I, I kind of mentioned at the beginning um, in the background of our, 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 our pony, we had these fireworks. We also had these M's that were showing up on these surfaces. Well, th this background is not generated programmatically or on the fly as part of the, the, um, the, the rendering algorithm. These are pre-stored images or, or textures. Um, and, and what you can do is when you have pre-stored images like this, like these fireworks, 
you can map them into your, your rendered image. And so you can imagine there's just a big triangle or sorry, a big square back here. Um, and what you would do is um, map each set of pixels in, in your world into this texture and, and go fetch them. Um, and that's basically what the texture unit or what texture mapping does is it maps um, on-screen pixels to pixels that are inside a texture. Now, um, that can actually create some very interesting and challenging sample problems. You could imagine um, if, if this image here were very small compared to the, uh, the size that you wanted to render in on screen, you've, you've got a problem where how do I sample the right number of picture, uh, pixels for this to, to show up? And likewise, you can have the opposite problem where you have a very large image that you're um, sampling into a very small area on screen. So there's a lot of hardware built into texture units to try to do a good job of, of sampling. And this is kind of an example that's showing that. You're taking um, a, a square kind of checkerboard pattern and then you're mapping it to something that is that is tall and skinny. And you can see the results of doing that mapping is your nice square image is now a number, a number of rectangles. And that's basically what the texture hardware is going to, going to do. This is kind of a more advanced, it's called anisotropic filtering uh, filter mode that's shown on the right hand side that kind of avoids some of these uh, weird artifacts that you see on the top screen. Um, but that's, uh, that's probably a bit beyond today's presentation. And that's the anti-aliasing that we mentioned before. Yes, that is a version of, uh, of anti-aliasing. Okay, so our last stage, we need to actually get this, get all these pixels that we've, we've worked on um, and get them written out to, to, to memory. Um, and so uh, there's usually an instruction not necessarily exposed to the developer, but at some point you've got all these pixels, usually in a cache on your chip, you need to actually write them out to the frame buffer um, and then tell the frame buffer or tell the display usually, hey, my image, my rendering is done, go pick up all this data and go go put it on the display. And that's that's kind of what the, the output stage is. Um, I, there's some other steps in there, there's blend tests, um, there's some stencil tests that I kind of glossed, glossed over a little bit, but that's that's really the, uh, the 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 gist of it. And what you can see on this, the bottom right hand side of this picture is this is kind of a frame buffer that's been captured like mid render. So some of the uh, the tiles or some of the pixels have completed. And you can see them on the screen. Others have have not. So you so you need basically need to wait till all of the work is completed before you say that you're re ready for for display. All right. So. Um, Let's get to our example. I'm trying to leave uh, about 10, uh, 10 minutes for questions at the end. So um, what I wanna sh uh, show you guys is a um, SaxPy algorithm run on um, uh, a CPU and, and a GPU. And, and actually it's even simpler than, than that. Um, we're simply going to uh, implement a function um, in C that takes a, um, an array uh, uh, X of, of floats multiplies each element in that uh, array by a float A and outputs it to an output array Y. And so we're just going to loop through the entire array and, and do that. Super simple. And we're not even doing the, the plus part. So we're just doing the, the, the multiply part. Um, and so we're going to do that in C on a single threaded CPU. And we're going to do a similar thing on, on a GPU in metal. And so this kind of um, code snippet is it may be less familiar to you guys than the C program, but it essentially does, does the same thing. I've got uh, an array X and output buffer Y, and I'm going to multiply them by A. So it does the same function, just a different language. Um, and so what does, what does that look like? And so, and I'm going to try to do this interactively in a, in a second. Um, but basically, this what the results I'm showing you here are going through a number of different buffer sizes. Um, and, and so it's really uh, uh, I squared. So you can see the buffer sizes here. Um, in the next column is the, the time in that it took for the GPU to finish the computation. Um, and then the last one, last column is the time that it takes the CPU to complete the comp uh, computation. So there's a few things that you'll, uh, you'll notice as you look at this data. Um, and as you get to the bottom, very clearly, once as your, your buffer sizes are getting very large, um, the GPU is clearly beating the, um, the CPU in terms of performance. It's taking less time to complete these operations. Um, and the crossover point is, where is it? It's 
kind of uh, right right around this this area where we see that the um, the GPU starts to be, beat the CPU. You'll notice that the CPU does much much better um, on the smaller buffer sizes than the GPU. And really, what what that tells you is that the GPU is not great at doing kind of small chunks of work. And the reason for that is there's a lot of overhead in getting the GPU set up and started, particularly on this this platform. Um, to setting it up to run the computation. And, and so you can see when I go through the first kind of five or six runs of this, the time it takes is, is more or less the same. In fact, it's oscillating up and down a bit due to you know, other random stuff going on in the system. Um, but once we get down to about here, um, the time starts increasing. So what that tells you is there's some fixed GPU overhead that's going on here um, and the CPU is way better. And so the reason for that is, is pretty simple. We're not getting any advantage of parallel processing for these very small buffers. And so for very small, simple jobs, your CPU is gonna do just fine. Um, once you get up to jobs that are millions or hundreds of millions of elements in size, um, the GPU is gonna do better. And so why is that? Well, that goes back to our, our what we've been talking about throughout this, this talk, SIMD processing. So if, if you go back, and I, and I will go back to our example, um, the CPU is basically doing um, what we talked about on the left-hand side here. It's going linearly through the array, running this very simple calculation one at a time. And so when this, this the number of entries that it needs to do the calculation gets very large, it's going to take a long time. The, the GPU is, is actually executing um, elements of, of that buffer in groups of, of actually more than four, probably 32 or 64 or even, even larger. Um, such that we're executing it in, let's call it 64, 64 size chunks. And so what that means is that the GPU is going to, is, is going to execute those instructions much, much faster. And we start to see that as the buffer size gets, gets very, very large. So um, I'm going to attempt to show this live. And I'm, I'm also running Zoom and sharing Zoom. So we'll see, we'll see how this goes. But um, what, what you'll be able to see, assuming my computer doesn't crash, um, is, is this program executed, let me make it, make it larger, uh, is, is executing this pretty, uh, executing this live during the talk. Um, and you can see how hopefully the, the GPU performance starts to outstrip the, the CPU as we go. Uh, and there it is, GPU is starting to, to beat the CPU. CPU time's getting getting longer and longer. We're about 2x the GPU right now. About 3x. I can hear my fan going up. There's a, there's a question uh, whether this is being done on the, the new M1 or <laughs> whether that would change things. I wish it was doing, being done on the new M1. Um, <laughs> no, I... I Oddly, my uh, my wife has one of those because I bought one for her. But my the oh. Mac I'm running this on for work, uh, I believe, is a 2018 uh, Intel based system. I don't know the sure. exact uh, sure. exact number, but it's a it's a uh, Intel integrated GPU. Mm -hmm. um, and then you can see by the time we we got done here um, that the the GPU was almost seven times faster than uh, the CPU for the largest the largest buffer size. Um, now, this was a, a very simple program, um, and in fact, uh, an astute uh, engineer might notice that, hey, this thing is actually not doing that much calculation. Um, so it, it actually is, 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 at least on the GPU memory limit, and we talked about memory bandwidth with earlier, the GPU is much better at moving chunks, large chunks of, of memory around than, than the CPU. So we are, we are also benefiting from not just the number of execution units, but the amount of um, the amount of memory bandwidth that we have. Now it turns out, I think on this particular CPU that I'm running on, um, because I've, we've ex explicitly set it to operate in a single core, single thread manner, um, the CPU core is likely mass limited. Um, well, I have not actually tested that. All right, so um, so here's a graph of what we just did. This is uh, obviously not the experiment I just ran, but you can see the results were pretty similar. So I ran this over the weekend without Zoom and other stuff running in the background. This is a logarithmic scale. Um, so, so notice that carefully. 
um, of, of where we, of our array size on the bottom with the runtime in milliseconds on, on the Y axis. You can kind of see the crossover point here. And then again, remembering that this is a logarithmic scale as we get up to these very large buffer sizes, um, the, the, um, the, uh, the GPU is, is beating the, uh, the CPU performance handily. All right, so let's wrap it up and then and leave some time for, for questions. So, um, so if, if you get nothing else from, from this presentation, um, please take away these, these three points. So getting efficiency and performance out of a GPU is all about maximizing parallelism, maximizing throughput via parallelism. You're tip, you want to run parallel programs where you're, where you're doing SIMD operations, you're running the same, uh, same instructions across multiple data. Um, that's what GPU performance is about. There's you know, some fu fixed function stuff on the side to do specialized math, like, like texturing. Um, but really what we optimize around is map maximizing performance through parallelism. That makes um, uh, like image processing for, for, uh, for cameras, for doing computational photography, for um, running uh, algorithms to do image detection. So um, uh, neural networks. Those neural nets, yeah. To be done on, on the GPU. It just ask Tesla. <laughs> just, just exactly. <laughs> um, and and GPUs, modern GPUs, are very easily expanded to do general purpose compute. So companies like like Nvidia and AMD have been very successful selling GPUs not just for for games, but for um, for building compute farms of GPUs for doing um, machine learning algorithms and, and and things like that. So that's a that's a big growth. Uh, factor for um, for GPUs in, in recent years. So with that, I'll stop there. I hope, hope you guys found this interesting. Um, let's do uh, right. some questions in the last few minutes. That was great, James. Thank, Thank you, you so much for Thank that. You. that. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. Wonderful. We've got a couple of questions that are open. Um, the first is, um, what's the software that's actually managing the coherency in the GPU? Um, would that be something built into the OS or how, how do you manage the coherency, making, making sure you're worried about um, threads stepping on each other? That's an excellent question. Um, the, the, the answer is it's really a combination of the application and the driver that is, that is programming and managing the lower level details of, of the GPU. So um, if you went and looked at a modern GPU, I, GPU API such as Metal, for example, um, there are facilities inside the Metal programming language they give you mechanisms for thread synchronization and memory synchronization. Um, and those kind of high, high level facilities get mapped to low level hardware commands like a cache flush or a fence or a barrier um, that the driver will convert into something that the hardware can actually understand. Um, and so to kind of perhaps bring that back to the question, the, the programmer does have to be aware of some of these synchronization requirements and how to, uh, how to manage parallel programming um, in combination with the driver. Because if you're not aware of those things, you're not gonna get good performance. Makes sense. On this kind of the same topic, do you need to worry about deadlock in GPUs? Um, the, the hardware team, meaning my team certainly does. Um, as a, a, as a, at a programming level, um, you need to worry about it kind of from the similar perspective as you would worry about hanging a, uh, a CPU by writing a, an infinite loop or, or two loops, especially if you're doing parallel programming that kind of depend each other, depend on each other in, in ways that could create deadlocks. Um, if you get down to the hardware implementation details, there are, um, there are actually all sorts of uh, hazards that can cause deadlocks that we spend a lot of uh, design and verification time trying to find and either just avoid architecturally or, or put in deadlock breakers, you may call them, into the hardware so that the hardware can't lock itself up. Um, so yes, it's it's something that we, we are very worried about. Boy, these are coming. As, as you answered one, four more questions showed up. Right. Students, hit, hit students, do, yeah. students are doing great. We've got 70 students here. Um, What's the ideal relationship, or is there an ideal relationship between the number of pixels and the number of execution units in a GPU? Like maybe as you go to 6K, 8K, how does that, how, you know, there's, some, there's some limits where GPUs can't drive an 8K screen. That's just talking on the screen, but in terms of the computation, is there a, you know, a mapping at all, or maybe a good, a, a yeah, good ratio? That's, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, the, the nice thing about GPU processing um, is that it scales very, very well. Um, and in particular, 
uh, if you're if you're doing like super high resolution 8K displays, um, then you're going to want, especially if we're running games and you want like high frame rates, you're going to want a big GPU to drive that. Now, um, there's no kind of fixed relationship. You could have a small modern GPU drive a 4K or an 8K display. Um, you're just going to get less performance out of out of your game uh, if you were playing a game, and you may not get 30 frames per second, so your game right. is look choppy and not not play well. So there's no kind of like fixed requirement, if you will. Um, but certainly, if you're going to run a, a complex modern game on a very high resolution display, you're going to want a bigger GPU with more cores to get a good gaming experience. So hopefully that kind of yeah. And I, I and I don't get this user perception of 120 frames per second. I I don't think my <laughs> eyes can do it. <laughs> yes, there's a lot of debates about 30, 60, or is, is 120 hertz even even useful? <laughs> well, and it's in film too, or right? I mean, what was it? Lord of the Rings had like the 60 or 120, and it was like, wait, this is looks like TV. Is something looks a little different here? Exactly. Yeah. Um, this is a great question from Adrian. Uh, what are some surprising applications where GPUs are used in places we might not expect? Oh wow, that's a that's a fantastic question. Yeah, I love um, it. Uh, I'm not sure if this would be surprising or not these days, but um, if you looked at uh, if you drive a Tesla or have been in a Tesla, uh, and I, I I'm not really anything secret about Tesla. I don't know anything secret about Tesla, so just to right. get that out there. Um, but my understanding is they use uh, GPU hardware to do a lot of their uh, their image processing algorithms for for self driving. Um, sure. So, uh, so you'll find you, you'll find GPUs in, in automobiles. You'll find uh, GPUs in a lot of places you wouldn't necessarily expect them uh, a few a few years ago. Similarly, on um, any modern phone, and I'm not talking specifically about Apple, but any modern phone is going to do a, a fair amount of, of computational photography these days. And a lot Ooh, of the that's a good point. Photography that's a good point. Run yeah. through the GPU to generate or, or to blend images together to generate. Yep image um right so photography right. is not simply about like hey how uh, how many megapixels are in my sensor um it's it's how good are the algorithms that you uh, are, are are running and, and how much gpu and other uh, horsepower do you have to run those algorithms such that the person taking the picture can see it in in less than a second so it's interactive imagine if you were taking a picture and it took 10 seconds for the final final picture to show up that that's not very fun for for a, a phone type use case, so so GPUs matter a lot in in that in that space as well. Especially with HDR imagery, I mean, you can you can compress that you know tonal tone mapping where you have a bright part of the screen and a dark part of the screen, but the GPU can take many pictures simultaneously or sequ in sequence and then compress them down into one that just captures at the highs and lows to reduce the dynamic range. I love it. Um, I knew this was uh, going to be. By the way, uh, I, I got get one. Uh, yeah, go, go, go. You know, there's one surprising thing. Uh, it's Bitcoin mi mining. Bitcoin, um, you know, Bitcoin oh. mining basically because of that. It, you know, a few years ago, it was all low end GPUs have been uh, sold out. I mean, it was not possible to buy a lower end <laughs> GPU because they're all. <laughs> That's fascinating. Um, it, I didn't know that. Yeah, Look now you can buy cheap dedicated hardware that does these hash functions yeah, uh, right. more efficiently. That's the biggest <laughs> yeah. uh, Three years ago, I think it was December when, when Bitcoin was taking off, you could not find a high-end GPU. People were were selling them for thousands of dollars for people wow. wanting to go Bitcoin mining. So that's an wow. excellent example. And the, by the way, I just looking at the, the, the latest Mac Pro, the high-end GPUs are like two thousand dollars just by themselves before they before the price you know increase because people want to you know buy them to do these things. The high-end GPUs can be very expensive. Um, this is Adam. A great question. I knew this was going to come up. This is so cool. How do, can we students play with some graphics image processing code? How do we code to use a GPU ourselves? I think the first answer is get a Mac. <laughs> yeah, yep. get, get a Mac. Um, they, we have metal, uh, Apple has metal programming guides and very simple examples of just how to get started. If you just Google, I should put a link in here, but if you just Google uh, metal programming, like introduction, um, there's some online tutorials that you can go through and go like, hey, how do I write like my hello world? Of, of GPUs using metal. Uh, and I'm sure NVIDIA and, and AMD have the same thing for, for their hardware using other, other languages. So there's definitely tutorials out there. And there's also, I think, um, CUDA and OpenCL, is that right? Those two those are libraries? Yes. Those are compute yes. uh, programming APIs. Uh, CUDA is specific to, to NVIDIA. Uh, and OpenCL, um, I'm not sure how much that is used as much these days. That was more of an right. open open API cross-platform. I, mean, I think it's been replaced by CUDA and, and others. 
Right. He's like, hey, I'll, I'll just add to the question, and, which is the code that you showed in Metal, you could be running on a built-in CPU on a laptop or a high-end Mac Pro with a dedicated two boxes of a CPU. Do you need to worry about that at that level, at the Metal level? It just it just is handled by by the nope. by the by the abstraction layer, right? That's as long as you write it in a way that's parallel programming friendly. Um, it doesn't matter if you're targeting like something built into a phone or if you're targeting a, a giant GPU system, the, the API takes care of that for you. That's wonderful. Now, unfortunately, I've got, I think, 14 questions left, but we promised chemistry, which actually needs this, this webinar. Like now, we're now two minutes into the webinar. So okay. folks, let's, let's give James a hand. Thank you so much for coming and sharing those thoughts about the GPU. Thank you, James. Woo! Thank you, James. Wonderful, wonderful, it. wonderful. So grateful to have you right. here. Thanks, thanks again. Outstanding, outstanding lecture. There was a meta question about are these slides confidential. Well, we don't have the copies of the slides, but we have the web, we have the webinar. So we'll just keep that, and they'll just be able to watch the slides through the webinar. I'm guessing. Yep. Okay. Perfect. Yep. Perfect. Thanks okay. so much. All right. Thank take you. care, everybody. And stay here if you want to watch the Chem Thank One A you. lecture. <laughs> okay. Take care, everybody. Take care. Thanks again, James. Bye. Bye. Stay safe, folks. Wonderful. Bye. All right. Bye bye.